I'm Jeff Baskerville, a former BBC radio producer and presenter. And I'm Hugh Strawn, and I'm a professor of international relations at the University of St Andrews, and I work predominantly on the First World War. Well, Hugh, we're a year on from a significant date in most people's minds, which is the end of the four-year First World War. But the First World War comprises so many things. It's not just a time slot with a neat beginning and a neat end. And it doesn't just comprise fighting in trenches. It's a much more multifaceted, personal to global issue. And we've been remembering it. And it's the word remembrance that I would like to focus on here. What do you think we mean by remembrance in that kind of enormously varied context? And how do we actually approach it? I, I think it's a very difficult uh, question to answer, partly, of course, because none of us actually remembers the First World War. Uh, this is uh, a war which uh, now is outside living memory. Um, I, I say that sometimes with a little caution because I have uh, occasionally been at events and said, nobody here remembers the First World War, uh, and an old lady will put a hand up and say, I was four when the war ended or whatever, and I, I can remember it. But, but none of us remembers it in terms of adult experience. Um, and equally, very few of us have direct personal contact and actually knowing somebody who served. I mean, in my case, my grandfather did serve and, and he, he died when I was eight, but I, he had served in the war. So there is a personal contact. But for, you know, I'm now an old man and, and, and you know, those younger uh, don't have that direct connection. So uh, is remembrance even the right word? Commemorations become a word which we've used a lot instead, and I think that is helpful in two ways. One is we are actually standing very often in front of memorials which commemorate, uh, which uh, are designed to uh, mark the deaths of particular people, none of them own, uh, known to us personally, uh, designed to commemorate particular events, um, and so it is. Uh, that that notion of memorialization, perhaps, which is inherent in commemorate. Um, and the other reason has been we're, we're talking about war. Um, and war, particularly this war, uh, but war in general, carries connotations for us of uh, suffering, loss, uh, waste. Um, uh, you know, I think very often those, those stereotypes can become unhelpful. Uh, but in this context, uh, it's important to remember them. Um, there, I do. there I go, using the word again. Um, and what we're doing uh, is commemorating rather than celebrating, uh, particularly in relation to the First World War. Uh, I think everybody involved at any official level with the centenary was very anxious to avoid the notion of triumphalism, that there should be any suggestion that this was uh, something that we should be uh, celebrating uh, was uh, seen as not appropriate. Unlike 1945, uh, the end of the Second World War, which it is regarded as legitimate for us to uh, approach with some sense of triumphalism, because that is a war we now see as a necessary war the First World War, of course, very often we do not see as a necessary war. Um, you're a key historian of the component parts of the First World War, along with other aspects of military history in di different periods. But you've also been deeply involved in how the last four years' worth of commemorations have been formulated, taken place, discussed, argued over, bits taken on, bits rejected. What do you think we're trying to bring into our own time that is of significance to people who don't have memory of it and only a notion of it. I, I think in some ways it's, it's been, uh, uh, particularly here in Britain, we've done it in that respect quite unreflectively at times. We've sort of, we sort of stumbled into the solution to that question uh, because we had patterns of remembrance anyway, which we had inherited as it happened from the First World War. Uh, we had um, uh, Remembrance Sunday, we had Poppies, we had the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and their cemeteries, you know, we, uh, and we had our local war memorials, and all those provided ways in, and that was exactly how most of the British public first became involved, and it was exactly where, on the whole, at governmental level, governments came in as well. But all along, 
Um, and certainly once the momentum grew, then remembrance was a vehicle into understanding. In other words, it was a departure point rather than a concluding point. Uh, standing in front of a memorial, war memorial was not sufficient unless you began to ask questions of that memorial. Who's there? Why are they there? What happened to them? And who's not there? You know, very often if you stand in a, in a village or a town, you see a war memorial, um, what you're seeing is actually a minority from that community who went to serve because the majority, the vast majority, came home. 88% of those who put on uniform in the First World War uh, in the British Armed Services came home. Not true if you were a flying corps pilot when you had uh, a less than 50% chance of coming home. Not true if you were an infantry subaltern. Not true indeed if you were very often an infantry soldier. But of course, lots of people were doing other things in this war. So did this really present you with uh, a tension between having to in some way address people's mythologies and a need to remember in a certain way and then actually explain or tease out things that people perhaps would rather not have remembered or know about? I, I think actually people welcomed the opportunity to move on. I mean, you, so if, if, not always, but in my experience over the last four or five years, if you said, think about this memorial in a rather different way from the way you have been thinking about it, they welcome that opportunity. If I said, you know, rem think about where some of these people died. Were, did they all die on the Western Front? Answer, no. You, you know, probably the majority did. What about the Navy? Where's the Navy in this? Where are the sailors on this memorial? Where did they die? Um, how many of them died of disease, not of being wounded? I mean, what's remarkable about this, this war is that uh, so few die of disease, in previous wars, disease was actually the bigger killer, bigger than the battlefield. Uh, in this war on the Western Front, that's not true, but most other fronts, disease does remain a bigger killer than, than, is, than is action on, on the part of the enemy. So ask yourself questions that take you into a different awareness of this war. So that, that, that's perfectly possible. Um, and it's, it, on the whole, as I say, people responded occasionally uh, people's focus was so great. I, I remember being, and I better not name the, the town, but I was in a town and they had done a big project supported by the Heritage Lottery Fund on the names of, of the names on their war memorial. Whereabouts in the town they came from, where they went to school, what jobs they had, who survived from the family. All, you know, in themselves, interesting questions. I then said, what about the adjacent town? Is your experience typical or is it unusual? Are there more in the Navy, fewer in the Navy, because it was close to the coast? Um, and what about those who served and came back, who were the majority? And in that particular case, they really didn't want to know. And I thought, well, actually, for me as a historian, those comparative questions are important questions because they actually highlight whether the experience of this town is typical or atypical, whether it's something that is characteristic of, cross of the United Kingdom as a whole or whether it's something unusual and strikingly different. Um, and we, we're not always getting to the bottom of that. Can we draw from this, you know, new generations, different types of war, wars happening in different parts of the world, still ongoing and still a need in some way to digest them? Can we draw anything from the experience of this kind of commemoration that's gone on and work with it? Uh, I, I think we can, and there's clearly a relationship. I mean, I think one of the reasons why Britain find it very easy to do the First World War centenary, easy perhaps is the wrong word, but, but, it, but it wasn't a great rite of passage, was because we already did Remembrance Sunday anyway. We already sold poppies to raise money for the British Legion. The British Legion is itself a First World War product. Um, so there is a continuity there. And what we were doing was amplifying uh, something we were already doing rather than beginning from scratch. What people remembered about the First World War was the pattern of remembrance. It was the logical way <coughs> into the whole process. So, so uh, then to add on subsequent wars uh, is also something we have done, specifically and most uh, dramatically, of course, in the Second World War, where the conscious decision was taken uh, after the Second World War to keep Remembrance Sunday with its First World War associations rather than move to VE Day or VJ Day. Um, but also to think about the dead since 1945. There, I think the response has been more patchy across the United Kingdom. Um, if you think about the wars, let's say, between uh, 
1947, which is when the Commonwealth War Graves Commission responsibility ends, up to, let's say, the end of the Cold War. Some communities have, have, have acknowledged they're dead, some have not. If you go to France, you will see there's regular uh, representation from the ancien combatants uh, from Indochina, from Algeria, from the wars of decolonization. Not so obvious for us. Uh, but Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, those two conflicts, the fact that they were ongoing while we were doing the centenary, or Afghanistan specifically during the years of the centenary, meant that uh, there was an immediate link in people's minds with current conflict and current war that provided some sense of continuity for all the differences in those wars and for all that they did not, of course, require the mobilization of the whole of society as the First World War did of Britain. Do you think remembrance, perhaps this is a final question, do you think remembrance is uh, an occasional thing, something that you do in part of a week or is it something that people build into their lives? I don't think most people build it into their lives. I mean, they may, of course, do remembrance in the sense that uh, each of us might do it individually in relation to members of our own family. But it is striking that we do it more readily in relation to those who are killed in war than we do it in relation to those who die of old age, grannies and grandpas who have died uh, and who, it, for whom it seems part of the natural progression. I, I, I remember uh, a wonderful Australian historian, sadly, who died in 2016, Jeff Grave, prematurely, coming to Oxford when I was then teaching there and saying, why is it that all these Australians are so anxious to find great uncle Bert, who is uh, buried at, uh, in, uh, at Fromel in, in, 20, in 1916, that, that was a new cemetery created at Fromel uh, as a result of an Australian mass grave. And many of these bodies were identified through DNA testing. Why, he said, are they so keen uh, to find great uncle Bert, but they haven't the foggiest idea where great aunt Sheila is, who's buried somewhere in Australia? Such is remembrance. Absolutely. Selective. <laughs>